Welcome back to Bargaining in War. Today's topic is Issue Indivisibility. This is part of Chapter 3 of a textbook, and like everything else that we've been working on recently, we're taking a single extension from the baseline model. We're going to make a single tweak to the assumptions of that baseline model, and then we're going to see what happens as a result of that and whether we can get war to occur as a consequence. So with issue indivisibility, the thing that we're attacking is the idea that the settlement that can be proposed is some amount between zero and one. So all along we've been saying, hey, if we want to create a settlement, then that settlement can be any division so that player A can get anything between zero and 100% of the stakes that are in dispute with the other state. So again, to visualize this, if we have the zero one interval, the thing that we have become very accustomed to, then any division, according to the standard assumption, is possible. It doesn't matter how fine grained you get, you can keep getting finer and finer grained. Everything is available for the parties to choose from. That's the idea of an infinitely divisible good. What we're doing with issue and divisibility, in contrast, is to say, in fact, you can't choose from any value between 0 and 1. There's just going to be some sort of set amounts that you can choose from. We'll call them x1, x2, x3, and so forth. So in the extreme case, you can think of just x1 being here, where we can give one side none of it and the other side all of it and x2 being on the opposite extreme so now the side that was getting all of it before is getting nothing and the side that is getting nothing before is now getting everything but again having this be some sort of fixed number of different divisions it's like saying well you know maybe it goes beyond just those two maybe there's like this one is possible and this is possible there are only four possible divisions nothing more to give you some sort of substantive background for why you might think about this as being a concern, you can imagine an island that is in dispute between the parties, where it's a small island, and so dividing it in half isn't really sensible. It only makes sense for one party to get all of it and the other party to get none of it. And trying to break it up into smaller quantities just really doesn't make sense. It's not practical to do. Okay, so let's imagine that we have that being the case. Does that get us war? Well, again, let's turn to the extreme example where it's an all or nothing affair. So we can only choose that player A gets none of it and B gets all of it, or that A gets all of it and B gets none of it. There's only two options in this one. This is a firmly indivisible good. It's an all or nothing affair for everyone. Well, think back to how we constructed the bargaining range from the start of this when we were proving war is an efficiency puzzle, puzzle and showing that there should be a range of settlements that are mutually preferable to war. So we have A, probability of victory being P. We add the cost to it for B to move that to the right. We then subtract A's cost, P minus CA. And this quantity right here, everything between P minus CA and P plus CB is what we call the bargaining range. And you'll remember that when we have an infinitely divisible good under the standard assumptions, it's very easy for us to get peace because we know we can always choose something in the bargaining range because this is an infinitely divisible object. We always have a bunch of different choices to choose from, all within the bargaining range. And if we propose one of those things, then neither side would prefer fighting a war to accepting that proposal, precisely because it is in the bargaining range. It makes both parties better off. But in this hypothetical example where we have an extreme case where the good is very rigid and it's an all or nothing affair, well, this good, or rather this division here and this division here, neither of those are landing within the bargaining range. And in fact, unless your costs for war are very large such that, for example, if B, B's cost for war was very large and we were moving this thing out to here, if we moved CB out to here, so P plus CB is going all the way out there. Well, in that case, we can fit in this particular settlement here because now B has a negative value for war, so B is willing to forego the entire good and give it to A. In that circumstance, we can get peace. But outside of those extreme examples, if we have the zero one as being the only choices available to us, none of those are in the bargaining range, and so we would get war. 
Now, if we have this being a little bit less rigid, so we're not just choosing from the zero one good, you can still have it so that nothing is following in the bargaining range. So here, now we're opening up two other settlements. Again, neither of those fall in the bargaining range, so we can't get a deal to happen. We have to have war. In fact, you can have tons and tons of available settlements. And if none of them are following in the bargaining range, then we're still in trouble. We still can't get a settlement to work. If you have a divisible object that is not something that you can infinitely divide, there's just fixed number of divisions available to you, unless at least one of them is following in the bargaining range, then we're in trouble. We're going to get war. All right, so then the next question is, how practical is this as an explanation for war? Do we actually see wars occurring as a consequence of this? Well, it turns out that researchers in the conflict literature are very skeptical of issue and divisibility as a cause for war. And the reason is something known as side payments. So go back to that small island as an example. Yes, maybe let's take it as a given that we cannot adequately divide the island between the two of us. It has to go all to one party. Well, there's still something else that we both care about aside from the island, namely perhaps money. And if one of us really wants the island, we can pay the other party some fixed amount of money and convince them that taking that fixed amount of money is better than fighting a war over the island. And this is, in fact, something that we have seen before. If we go back to the Spanish-American War, the United States, at the end of fighting between the U.S. and Spain, had control over the Philippines, Cuba, and Puerto Rico. And Spain thought that if they continued fighting, they would be able to get something better out of the deal than losing all three of those islands. And the United States realized that there was that incentive for Spain to keep fighting. And so for the United States, the solution was, all right, well, we can't adequately divide the Philippines, Cuba, or Puerto Rico, but what we can do is write a check to Spain. And that's exactly what the United States did. The United States spent what is now about $619 million dollars wrote a check to Spain saying, hey, we understand that you are not happy with what's going on with the division of territory, but there's not much we can do in terms of dividing the islands. We can, however, give you a bunch of money. And if you're okay with taking this bunch of money, then we'll consider everything settled and we'll have a peaceful agreement. And that's exactly what happened. So for issue indivisibility to cause war, it has to be the case that there is no other continuously indivisible object, rather continuously divisible object out there that the parties can use to negotiate. Or if we do have a continuous object out there that we can use to negotiate, it needs to be the case that that isn't very much value as compared to the indivisible good. Because as long as we have a divisible good, that can be infinitely divided, that is of substantial value, then we have enough liquidity to overcome the problem of only being able to negotiate here and here. When we have a continuously divisible object that has a bunch of value, then we have the liquidity to be able to find something that is going to go inside of the bargaining range instead. And so that's why we as conflict scholars don't really think too much about issue indivisibility as being a cause for war, even though in theory, it is a perfectly reasonable explanation for why you would be unable to reach a settlement that both sides would prefer to fighting. All right, that's it for this lecture. Hope to see you next time. Take care.